we are still discussing or we are still exploring the different ways to differentiate. And I hope that you were able to get some ideas on how you can actually differentiate content or those things that we want our students to learn. This next part will help us or hopefully would give you an idea on how our students can better learn if we differentiate that part that connects the learner to the student, that part that we call process. We will now examine ways on differentiating process. Now, process would refer to the strategies used by the students to learn the material. Take note, it says used by the students, not used by the teachers. Because actually, when we want our students to learn, it is not us or we are not the ones performing. We want our students to be engaged with the activities. And so we want them to actually do something in order to learn something. That's what we call learning by doing. And so we are going to examine ways on how we can differentiate process. There are different ways. The first one would be differentiating process of organization. Another would be differentiating process for varied response time. And finally, this may be a new concept for some of us using the flipped classroom. We'll have more of the, flip, of the flipped classroom towards the end of this part. And so, differentiating process of organization. I'm sure we all had that experience of making a scrapbook. In our art subject, we probably had an activity involved in involving crayon etching. And then we have another art activity where we have cutouts of colored paper and paste them in such a way that the final output would look like a flower. But actually, it's more of like a fruit, but it looks like a flower. And so towards the end of the class or towards the end of that quarter grading period, your teacher would have asked you to come up with a portfolio. So you would be compiling all of these and submit it to the teacher. Now that I'm a teacher, I know what happens to those portfolios once they are submitted. Sometimes we really have no choice but to dispose of them. Now, isn't that a waste? Something that's created from the creativity of our students will just be thrown to waste. Thankfully, through technology, we can provide our students with a way to organize their output. We can provide them to come up with a sort of a scrapbook or a portfolio that would not require storage space in the physical sense. One such example is the e-portfolio. Now, this one was made using the genuine learning management system wherein you can see the different recognitions that his or her own, that student's online work had acquired, the different readings associated with it. Something similar to a wiki, if you're familiar with the wiki. Wiki, these are articles that you can find in Wikipedia and other wiki sites. This one is electronic and knowing students they are very, very good at using electronic media. They are very, very good at using technology. An advantage of using technology for making portfolios like this, they would have less resources to use except their computer, except their connectivity, which the school can provide, assuming that your school has connectivity. And I assume that your school has connectivity. And so, with this kind of portfolio also, your student maximizes the kind of organization that he wants. Of course, you will only give a certain rubric, but your student would decide on how he or she wants to get organized. And he would be using technology. How's that? Okay. This one makes use of an online learning management system, which is a very important component when we want to use online resources. It takes some time before we can actually search for different online materials. And so, having a learning management system would enable us to sort of curate or collate all of those online reference, online reference materials. Which brings us to another concept which I want to introduce right now. It's called blended learning. In blended learning, there is an online component and there is a classroom face-to-face -face component. In one 
example of online learning or blended learning, we make use of online platforms. The example given is something that makes use of an online platform, a learning management system called Genio, Genio which your school probably subscribes to. Now, one thing good about online platforms is that you can actually implement what you call a blended classroom. Now, what is a blended classroom? A blended classroom combines online instruction with face-to-face -face instruction. And so, you have an online sort of virtual class going on that complements your face-to-face -face interaction. Teachers and students interacting in the classroom with an additional feature of teachers interacting with students online. And not just that, students also interacting with each other online. One common problem that some teachers would say who are new to online platforms is that, hey, I posted this, I posted an announcement, and my students do not read it. So we ask, when did you post your assignment? And the teacher would say, I posted it yesterday. And what do you expect? Since they are students, the teachers would respond, since they are students, they are supposed to have known what I posted. One thing about online platforms is that we have to recognize that there are varied response times. Not all online discussions are synchronous or occurring at the same time like a chat. Some discussions can occur in an, as in an asynchronous manner. And so there are varied response times. Think Facebook, which is something like this. So this is differentiating process account or to account for varied response times. Let me share with you a particular forum which I posted online. This is a discussion on the use of guidelines called the COSA guidelines to validate whether an online resource is worthy to become a reference. So this was what I posted. Allow me to read it. On our first few meetings, it was presented that millennials are intuitively digital. Hence, it is no surprise that children as young as three years old are familiar with gadgets like tablets or smartphones. For this online discussion, let us discuss on this topic, should children be allowed to have Facebook accounts? To participate in the discussion, you may either, so they have choices. One, they can answer the question directly with an explanation of their answer, or they could post an article related to it of course with a brief explanation and they can comment to our previous post so this particular forum would be valid for a few days as indicated in that post and soon students came or rather came online with their comments they posted their comments take note that the days of these comments are not the same because there are varied response times What's good about this is that the students are given the freedom when they want to learn. As opposed to the old school of learning, hey, you have to study at this time. Students love the idea that they can actually learn at any given time that they want. These are grade 11 students. And this particular idea that they can post something even in the middle of the night is something that appeals for them. And the insights that they gave are quite interesting. Children shouldn't be allowed on Facebook. Children shouldn't be allowed on Facebook. But there are different ways, there are different reasons. Actually, this discussion lasted for more than the week allotted, and we had an enriching discussion after this. Of course, in a blended type of learning, this discussion is followed by a synthesis in the classroom. Take note, the discussion was online, but it enriched the experiences inside the classroom. Even though you are not able to meet them at the same time like in a chat, but accounting for their varied response times allowed you to actually enrich your lesson, allowed you to actually enrich the learnings of your students. In blended learning, there is what we call the concept of flipped classroom. Flipped as in flipped, flipped, putting something upside down. And what concept has been made upside down? For most of us, when we were studying, this was how we were taught. When we came to school, the teacher would start with a motivation. And then the teacher would present the lessons, discuss something. And if we're lucky, if the teacher was imaginative enough, there would be 
an acetate showing a certain topic. And then there will be a discussion. Afterwards, the dreaded quiz, if there will be a quiz. And of course, after the quiz, there will be the assignment. In a flipped classroom, it's done the other way around. What is a flipped classroom? It is a pedagogical model in which the typical lecture and homeroom elements of a course are reversed. Short video lectures are viewed by students at home before the class discussion. Take note, before they come to class, they already have the content. So it's like saving time in class for presenting your, presenting your topics uh, for the motivation because when they come to the classroom, when they get inside their classroom, they are already equipped with some sort of understanding about the lesson that you want to present to them. So that during your in-class time, you could devote the time for exercises, projects, and more enriching discussions. So that what the students have learned from their assigned video or assigned reading, they would be able to clarify it with you. Because now you are in the classroom. This is not really something new if you're familiar with home reading reports wherein the teacher would assign a certain reading and then you would be asked to report on it. The thing is, with the flipped classroom, it's also possible to assign your lessons in other subjects so that the students could have the necessary readings. They could watch videos that would better explain the concepts to them, come to the classroom prepared, and usually ready and eager to ask you questions a more enriching discussion in which students would actually learn something from. And as a teacher, you have more opportunities to clarify what needs to be clarified, to clarify misunderstandings, to clarify concepts that were not clearly understood. This is an example of a flipped classroom. Later on, we're going to show you a lesson that makes use of the flipped classroom model to explain an important concept in digital citizenship. In the last module of our Ways to Differentiate, we shall be talking about how to differentiate the final output, how to differentiate the product.